So thank you to the entire seller panel who's joined us here today. Ravi Kaushik, who's the partner of Waterbridge Ventures, Namita Dalmia. And of course, this shows the kind of work that Ravi has done in uh, the VC space. Namita Dalmia, who is the director investment for Omidyar Network and also sort of manages the social impact of the entire investments, uh, particularly in the education space, uh, education technology space that they are doing. Uh, we also have uh, up next, uh, Karan Mohla uh, from Chirate Ventures. Anil, sorry, Anil Udhamani first, who is the managing partner of Artha Venture Fund. Uh, and he invests uh, in companies, particularly with follow on rounds up to series A. It's a family office fund and uh, they, keep on looking at newer investments and education today is very interesting. And uh, up next, we also have Karan Mohla. Can I have the next speaker on the screen, please? Who is the partner of Chirate Ventures and uh, formerly it was called IDG. And some of, I think you have the most envious investments, Karan, uh, in the education technology space today. Uh, and it's only likely to become bigger and uh, we wish you all the best there. And um, uh, do we, okay. So going forward, let's uh, move ahead with the discussion. And uh, one of the first areas I think uh, that we would like to touch upon in this discussion is as to what, uh, according to the panel, you feel the edtech trends where investments are going to move in will emerge. Understandably, understandably during this time, we have seen tutoring or uh, live classes uh, having sort of got a majority of funding and anybody who was in uh, uh, live training space, whether it was in K-12 space or whether it was upskilling or whether it was higher education, uh, got majority of funding. But going forward, once we are in the post-pandemic zone, what kind of ed tech sectors do you think are going to be very interesting for you to look at? Um, so let me start with Ravi over here to understand, uh, you know, what in ed tech is now particularly going to be interesting for from a VC perspective. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ritu, first of all, for the opportunity. Uh, uh, very excited to be here. I think, uh, look, obviously, EdTech is such a vast segment. And if I have to name a couple, I think there are still some white spaces in state government exam. Uh, there, are, there are a very large number of candidates who give state government exams. Uh, there aren't enough EdTech companies who go after them because of a variety of reasons. So I think that that is one space I think has uh, quite a few white spaces there. And the second one is around the whole skilling space, uh, skilling, uh, upgradation of your post degree. Haven't seen enough of those. There are some large companies there, yes. And I think a lot more uh, can happen in that space. So I think I would say these two sort of areas where there could be more opportunities. Not saying there aren't in the, in the bread and butter of edtech, which is K-12 and test uh, but just sort of throwing it out. Sure. In fact, you know, today, uh, earlier in the day when we were, uh, the sessions were going on, this was one of the core discussions that assessment has particularly still lagging because uh, getting any kind of assessment uh, um, uh, to, do, to be done online is still very, very tough. So, yeah, you made a great point over the state assessment, but I think right down to school assessment, it is still very hard for schools to get that going. Um, Anirudh, your thoughts on this? Um, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And you know, I'm glad to be on this panel. I think you know, I, I echo uh, what Ravi says. Uh, there are still some white spaces, I uh, but I also think that there is, you know, been also been some overfunding in certain areas. And I think, uh, you know, this whole online uh, education space, you know, once these schools open up again, uh, whether it is six months, 12 months, there is going to be a new, new normal. Uh, however, I don't think all of these platforms that are trying to tutor online or trying to teach online will all survive. I think there'll be some, there'll be a huge shakeout and probably some consolidation over there. That being said, what's really been exciting me during this, during this pandemic is these uh, tech upskilling uh, programs, right? A lot of these uh, companies that are actually helping techies uh, that are either, either graduated from a technology institute or actually are at work, like Ravi was saying, and they're looking at upskilling them during while they were at work. I think that's, that's a very interesting space. Uh, I've seen some very interesting models over there where, you know, it's, it's, uh, you don't have to pay unless you get a job or, or you, know, you get a higher pay, things like that. I think those are very interesting models. I would like to see something in the finance field because obviously coming from a finance space myself, I think that's, that's definitely an area because there's a huge lacuna between what happens at the MBA schools 
and what we as as P V C or or investors, uh, you know, running running our funds would would actually look for uh, when it comes to you know financial modeling or or research that kind of stuff. So I think I've been actually been very vocal. I've been looking for someone who's going to reskill or upskill finance workers. I think that's a big space because uh, there's a good there's a couple of really good companies already invested into it on the tech side. So I think that would be something very interesting. Sure, totally agree. Uh, Karan, uh, I mean, you know, coding uh, has been a very interesting space that has emerged, um, coding education that is, uh, in, in particularly during the pandemic, and we've seen how sort of a marvelous journey White Hat Junior has done. In fact, Karan was speaking earlier um, at the forum. Um, so, you know, I mean, do you see uh, such green shoots somewhere in the edtech sector sort of coming up and becoming large in edtech? I mean, coding is one example, but any others that come to your mind? For sure. I think um, it's actually a very interesting time to be talking about EdTech and you know, uh, I think credit must definitely be given to Navita and the Umelia team for supporting White Hat Junior for at a time where I think a lot of people didn't quite understand it. Um, but I think what if you kind of take a step back, overall what this last six months has kind of shown and I think there will be some medium and longer term uh, fallout from that in, in a good way. Um, is that some of the behaviors will change more or less permanently. And, um, you know, Ravi touched upon one of them, which is if you look at government or state, uh, central or state government um, or district level exams, I think they've always been there. They will be there. But I think the ability of people of, um, who are taking those steps to actually move to more digital platforms has gone up because there's no choice. So I think that's clearly an opportunity which didn't exist before because there was very little in terms of a digital platform doing it, it was all offline. Um, I think continuing education, continuous learning overall, it's not necessarily a um, sort of green shoot, but I think the awareness of people to try and you know continuously upscale, continuously learn, A, because they have time, but B, I think everybody realizes you kind of have to do that. Right? Um, so I, that's more of a mind shift change as opposed to a new industry that started. And then lastly, um, you know, the whole, the one area of, uh, of early learning uh, or learning for, you know, children in sort of outside of school curriculum. So coding is a great example, but I think that kind of shows that there is a, a much larger and broader market out there, which doesn't necessarily need to be restricted to India as Whitehead you know, kind of showed very well. Um, but I think that part of it, whether it's related to school curricular or whether it's extracurricular, um, I think that's an interesting area. Um, it's also, um, maybe relatively speaking, a little bit easier to start up um, because it's about aggregating supply, which is there, somewhat fragmented. But I think how you build a sustainable business around that, um, that would be interesting to see. So that, that's probably some of the areas that we see um, as being either you know, green shoots emerging in new areas or you know, things which kind of exist in the offline world coming online. Sure. Uh, and we're quite kind of looking forward to this. Uh, Namita? Any, any thoughts you have on this? Particularly, you know, so one, uh, one thing uh, that uh, one of our earlier speakers pointed out was the need for rural education to uh, take a front seat and the Gram Panchayat becoming more empowered uh, to sort of promote the whole idea of digital education. So from a social impact perspective, what, what is it that you think EdTech can do more? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, see if you, uh, I think one of the earlier uh, speakers mentioned that there is. I mean, the education sector is so diverse, right? If you think about curricula, language, boards, uh, so there is no one size fits all approach. So first of all, there is an opportunity to build scalable and profitable businesses in in education, and and right now we are scratching the surface in terms of reaching out to CBSC, IPSC, maybe some. Im- some few couple of state boards kind of uh, permeating, but you know there there is equal opportunity in terms of you know building for state boards, etc. And I think uh, they're not so much commenting on the role of gram panchayat. I think one will figure out an interesting distribution model because we have to also understand the price point that these students will be able to pay will be will be much lower than today what we are charging, and hence distribution will become key in terms of. Innovate, uh, innovative mechanism where you can, you know, you can get either a gram panchayat or other influencers to evangelize and get distribution costs. So, <clears throat> I think uh, besides what everyone else spoke about, I think there's one more area that I am particularly excited about from an investment perspective, 
and that is uh, skilling uh, or providing opportunities for students to learn while they are in college i think one of my biggest pain points is that uh, you know students finish grade 12 10th and 12th are like the most worry some things and then they enter college the first and second year just goes by right and nobody cares about what is happening but in come come third year they start really panicking and saying okay what do i do and from the third year till you know uh, graduation plus two years so many so many you know students or young people are in mess right like we, we know the state of our country employers are on the other hand saying these people these people are not employable and i think we are talking about upskilling i think but there is a real opportunity to actually enter much before right so whether it is by means of b2b or b2c directly but really kind of first catching the attention of college students starting the pre final year and building some Institutions uh, at at price points which are not necessarily the upskilling price points today, but lower price points which are attractive to college students. I think there there is definitely a real opportunity there. I also agree that the early learning is the exposure to early learning. You know that will actually create opportunities not just for live learning. I don't think live learning is the only mechanism that will work there. That's where multiple models will happen. Whether it's recorded content, whether it's a marketplace model, right? Because people are now exposed to what is possible uh, beyond their. you know immediate neighborhood where they can you know send their children for some kind of holistic learning not so much academic learning maybe so yeah so i think it's a very all in all it's a very exciting time for what can happen so you know another thing that came out today is that it's expected one third of the workforce is looking at uh, being part of the gig economy which means that practically you know they might um, and with national education policy in place and the pressures of boards becoming <clears throat> lesser now um do you feel uh, the concerns that you mentioned namita would continue to remain the same i mean the gig workers who work on projects rather than organizations um would continue to face these pressures of uh, trying to compete <coughs> for degrees or trying to compete for um a certain level of grade or something actually degrees is lack of degrees is Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but lack of degrees is not the problem. I think we are actually degree manufacturers. The lack of skills is the problem, right? So, yeah, so skill skilling is the issue. So, one we need to kind of intervene and provide them the right skilling uh, before they graduate, so that they are they are ready for the workforce. Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, so this is uh, my uh, question is to the entire panel here that. do you really feel that uh, uh, i mean an academy or maybe even a baiju with now do them doing live classes i mean you know paytm became a paytm bank at the end of the day uh, so do you feel these uh, 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 edtech they are they becoming edtech institutions not really they are not edtech startups anymore becoming digital universities uh, they becoming you know like so their courses are actually accredited <coughs> by icte or by cbsc or ib board or whatever uh, and you know they they become mainstream education rather than actually just being um, you know uh, maybe just being like a facilitator or support system to the education they become the main education do you see such trends also coming in <clears throat> anyone who would like to comment on it <clears throat> well actually uh, prashant this side uh, this is uh, true because uh, digital is borderless and uh, it is also um, you know the skill scale will also depend on what is the strategy what is that you are offering uh, and this is uh, quite fascinating to the uh, startup community that how they will be able to grab that mind share and ultimately the market share uh, and hence we are seeing that uh, there will be an emergence of very focused uh players because if you look at uh, there are generalistic <coughs> edtech players and there will be specialist uh, edtech players so the generalistic market will very soon uh, you know flood and we will actually start getting getting crowded but uh, if you actually look at some very specific vocational skills and training because post covid what is likely to happen is also the way people look at their education uh, 10 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 is going to change quite a lot and uh, the decentralization of what we call as an extreme urbanization will also create a lot of opportunities and uh, hence the quest or a desire of an uh, student to go to urban areas to premium institutes will actually start fading and vocational training when that starts getting in forefront what we call as you know the skilling the skilling is it for employability only or skilling for entrepreneurship and that will give a trigger to the next level of uh, you know the market explosion in the edtech space is what i feel 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Prashant. Anybody from the panel who would like to also uh, talk about it? Well, I think uh, there are both models that need to exist, right? One is this full stack and really basically what is really happening with, you know, as you mentioned, and, you know, companies are becoming like full stack and providing the, becoming the online learning company instead of an epic earlier in research. But I think there is also equal need for modular services, right? Modular offerings, right? Not all students or uh, will want uh, a full stack offering. Maybe they're getting something from somewhere, but they want modular offering also. And in fact, that unbundling is also important from a price point matching perspective, especially as you permeate the market, right? So, so, so I think of, uh, from a uh, product market fit perspective also, I think both will need to coexist and maybe different companies do the different things, right? For example, Vedantu in our portfolio is a full stack offering versus a doubtnut can, can be more modular offering and, you know, is really kind of reaching the, the next half billion users in very different ways. Sure. Um, and it was Ravi. I, I'd like to add to you know, what Namita said earlier, which is, you know, that we, we, India has essentially been a degree manufacturing country, right? I mean, and, and University of Phoenix, which is the online equivalent, maybe of Baiju's started in the US more than two decades ago. So I think finally we have something like that over here because I think education institutes and most NASCOM and all these guys have been complaining for many years that many of these institutes produce candidates that are not even fit for 90% of the jobs that they're applying for. So in that sense, having something like a Baiju's or having these platforms, quasi digital universities coming out and actually creating programs that will create workers that can fill a specific need for specific organizations. And, and, and many of these, I think, uh, because they won't have the, you know, the, the, the management overhead of a top of a typical university would probably reach out to industry and say, okay, what kind of candidates do you really want and start preparing them right from the colleges itself. I think that's the need of the hour, right? Get, creating workers that eventually, as soon as they graduate can go in and full and fulfill a role right away versus, you know, what, what's been happening is just creating a standardized beige kind of a worker and then expecting the organizations to sort of upskill them, reskill them over time. I think that's, that's what's going to eventually happen. Uh, and you'll see more models like Baiju's working out. Sure. Anybody else who would like to comment on this? Yeah, just to add, I think if you look at it segment by segment, right? In the K-12 space, nobody is trying to replace the school. Everybody is trying to take the time before and after school. So tuition classes, uh, the extracurricular classes, right? That's the model where every edtech tech in K-12 is. Um, similarly, if you look at test prep, there the model is slightly different. They're saying, don't go to coaching classes, take coaching from me because I can teach you all of this and more at a much better way, right? So I think uh, while they can become digital universities and why not, it really has to be seen in the context of which space are they operating in and hence what is the maximum value add that they can do. Because we have always maintained this that unless you are replacing an existing solution in a tech, it could be an offline coaching institute, offline tuition, whatever, you are not going to be relevant. In a tech, you can't be uh, a vitamin pill. You have to be the core food. Otherwise, it's very difficult to make money, very difficult for people to pay. Agree. Karan, you want to add to that? No, I, I actually think all the points I have, have been quite well covered. Um, but I, I, I certainly agree. I think there will be a, a fairly acute verticalization uh, across ed tech. The same way we've seen in many other sectors that, you know, where digital starts becoming more and more relevant. Um, so I think that's something which will be important in the next you know, 10 plus years. So do you feel that in education, there'll be more digital collaboration than a digital divide? That's a separate question altogether. I think, uh, let me take that. Um, no, I think there, there'll be a mix, right? It depends on what segment of the market you're kind of going after. Um, like we've seen with, uh, like one would have seen with in other sectors, um, there will be a certain base of consumers who will take to a digital or an ed tech platform a lot easier. It doesn't necessarily need to be uh, you know, across socioeconomic classes, actually, it may be more age-wise, right? People are because are more uh, comfortable doing that. But I think there will be some elements of uh, digital collaboration between the offline and the online world. Um, I think the key thing will be, <clears throat> you know, the what since we've been investing in edtech over the last seven eight years, um, how how any edtech platforms become can become the primary mode of that 
whatever that user is, is wanting to do, right? Whether it's learning, whether it's upscaling, whether it's um, uh, you know based on school school or college curriculum. Um, I think when that shift happens, like one has seen with uh, many of the large companies today, that's when you know a lot of the offerings become more mainstream. That's where you will see a digital divide, right? Um, but ultimately, without without the the effect that you know an edtech platform or a learning platform can have digitally, um, we will we will continue to be a um, you know, a country where the penetration of real education or real learning is at a very surface level, right? So the comment about uh, we're a country that manufactured de manufactures degrees, I think you will see everybody taking certifications because they can put it up on LinkedIn. But how does that translate into something more meaningful? Um, I think that that's the part which we need to try and solve for, which is kind of happening in some of the other, um, you know, economies where people have kind of realized that I think we're, we're still at stage one or stage two. Um, so I think that's my view on it. But it's something which is definitely here to stay. It's something which will play a much more uh, you know, relevant role in our lives. It doesn't matter if you're 40 or you're five. Right? It, it, it has to play a much more meaningful role. So that, at least that's my view on sort of the collaboration versus uh, the divide question. Sure. So any, any other thoughts on collaboration versus divide? Look, I think, uh, I think the collaboration is only increasing. If you take uh, both Mandita and our portfolio company, Doubtnut, I think 90% of the students are from tier two, three, and four, right? So uh, like Prashant said, it is without borders. So I think with, with head tech and uh, proliferation of mobile devices with internet, I think the collaboration will only increase. A lot of uh, material on head tech is still available for free. Uh, there are freemium models, premium models, a variety of models exist depending on who you are, what you want to get. But I only think the collaboration will increase. I don't think the divide is increasing. That's my opinion. Schools are not going away, right? So school, schools, schools are not only a place of learning. It, it serves many different purposes as parents. We would also know that. Right? Like it, it also serves as a place for um, as daycare, you know, in a very crude sense, but also as a place where people, where kids make friends, right? And similarly, colleges are not going away because real learning also happens beyond academics. Um, I think what's really happening is the uh, that you know where what was completely offline has been um, challenged to go online. Whether it's even in the after school. Uh, tuition space, right? Like all the tuition, the, the models which are essentially uh, providing SaaS services to the tuition teachers or now to the schools, right? I think what will, so it, I, I see this as a more collaboration that will happen. Of course, not everything that's working right now for the lockdown situation will continue to happen because schools are not going to do online classes once they open up, right? But but uh, teachers will adopt part of the things that, uh, that, uh, that, that are working for them and will continue to make sense to them. So I think and and I think we we've been talking a lot about you know school of uh, future and all of those things, but really um, it's more about within those uh, within those boundaries. How do we re rethink pedagogy and use technology to enable rather than replace what's happening? Right? So, yeah, I agree. So you know what is what is back to normal and the new normal of ed tech. So you know, are we are is everything? Do you sort of uh, envision everything remaining the same or becoming the same as in pre-pandemic, wherein schools were uh, are going to function the way they used to function, classrooms, or do you see that there is going to be some hybrid mix of digital and uh, physical classroom teaching? But I think more importantly, uh, uh, you know, one of the questions which come to my mind is, and this starts from the first question that I asked you about areas that will emerge now in edtech. Do you see enterprise edtech becoming larger, which is actually going to produce technologies for schools to be more enabled, uh, classrooms to be more enabled so that, you know, I mean, a kid is studying on the blackboard uh, in a school and then he goes home and he studies in Baiju and he can tell in his head that there is a lot of difference uh, between these two spaces. And, you know, so, you know, you, you eventually we want to empower the kid, not confuse him. So, I mean, you know, what is, so from my understanding, what is back to normal and what is new normal and how does, how do they come together now? I think you'll end up, instead of bouncing back, I think we'll be bouncing forward, right? And, and what, I, what I see eventually happening 
is uh, you know all these companies like Educomp and stuff back in the day. I think they were 10 years or 15 years ahead of their time. But now you've got a situation where what was supposed to happen five, seven, 10 years in our models is all happening today. And, and and the teacher was always one of the I think the central problem was always that, that how do you upskill the teacher who doesn't know how to use technology, right? The children already know how to use it. You know, my you know one year old nephew now knows how to, how to operate an iPad, right? But if if I if I ask one of my father to do the same thing, trust me, he would he, you know he's his eyes become really really wide all of a sudden, right? So I think the same issues that have been happening with teachers is that they see, look at this technology and they they get freaked out by it, right? But because of the pandemic, because if they wanted wanted to continue to have a living, in the last six months they've had to adopt, and in many ways they've been able to enhance their skills using technology. And now it's no longer you know, for many teachers, it's no longer it's something unknown, right? It's something they've tried, it's something they've used, and something they've gotten used to, right? And I think in in the new normal or the bouncing forward that I'm talking about, you will see a hybrid. There will be, you know, you you'll still have a classroom style teaching, but I think there'll be a lot more tech gadgets or tech, uh, uh, you know, platforms that teachers will now be, you know, open to and and willing to use because now they've been exposed to it for six months, right? It takes 21 days to build a habit you've been exposed to it for almost seven months now. And at least for the next four or five months, I don't see how schools are gonna open up 100% until we've got a solution to COVID, right? So in that sense, you know, we've got enough time. We've got, we've got uh, you know, a forced change happening and it's, it's, gonna be a new, it's gonna be a bouncing forward, not a bouncing back. Sure. I, mean, look, um, I think, you know, Anurudh brought up the point about what Educomp and all did and, um, I think the biggest problem was not necessarily the teachers, although that was certainly a problem, but also the ability of schools to adopt those solutions. And I, I worked with Educomp in another, after many years back, so I know the problems they went through. I, I, and I think that's where the change will probably come bottom up. It will come from students adopting it, leading to teachers having to adopt it, and then teachers kind of pushing schools to do it. But ultimately, large scale change cannot happen, at least in my view, in the near term. Um, Given some of the structural issues we have around how schools are run, and you know the, the issue around having private schools and you know adhering to state curriculum, etc., so I think there'll be some parts of it which will certainly have to seep in because you know if other stakeholders like parents and teachers and students are demanding it, schools kind of have to listen to them. But there is this great, um, you know, uh, there is rigidity to change, and that will not happen just because we are going through a pandemic or once schools open up even in 2022. Hopefully this puts us on the course for change in the longer term. And that's certainly my very strong positive hope, right? Um, but I, I do think going back to the early point that it will create that change amongst uh, teachers, like Anurud said, much more so than students because students kind of already were doing it. Um, but hopefully it will create the ability for educational institutes to adopt it to adopt digital um, infrastructure, digital platforms, and digital way of thinking. I think it's not about teaching, it's about how you think digitally first. Yeah. Philosophy. We, we, most of us do think digitally first, day, right? pre pandemic or post pandemic, it doesn't matter. That will take a little bit of time. But you know, hopefully, this is a good catalyst. And I can tell you, investors are looking at this space. You saw the funding um, that happened in Lead School, which is a full stack model for schools. And we have also made an investment in an, um, you know, starting as an enterprise solution to schools. We will be announcing it soon and you know, which enterprise to learning solution, but more modular. So I think both full stack and modular kind of work. So one has to kind of figure it out. So we're definitely looking at this space from an investment opportunity. This, yeah. this looks really interesting. Yeah, Ravi, please. No, so just to add, I think, uh, I think everyone's right. I think, we, I think I'm expecting digital schools going forward. Uh, teachers have adopted, schools are forced to adopt, parents and students are already there. That's one. And second, I think for the first time, we as parents know what our kids actually do, right? What kind of classes they take, how do they take, do they answer questions, what kind of homework do they get, how do they study, which means that the, the transparency between the school and the parent has dramatically increased. Yeah. And they can't go back on that. Right. Because of that transparency, teachers and schools will be forced to continue to give this transparency and more going forward. That automatically will lead to adoption of tech. Right. What I'm still waiting to see is efficacy of pedagogy on the child, whether it's offline, whether it's online, 
I'm yet to see that. Right? There's a lot of talk of AI, there's talk of ML, personalized learning journeys and all of that. But I'm yet to see all of that play out in, in the students, in children to see, are they thinking dramatically different with this versus that? And I'm hoping that we, we'll get some answers to all of these three things over the next four to five years. You know, you've already mentioned teachers here and everybody has. So, I mean, my, uh, and you know, uh, I think uh, Anirudh was right that one of the reasons why uh, schools have been lazy about adopting technology uh, much earlier before pandemic was that, uh, you know, schools as well as the teachers were still on a back foot when it came to adopting technology. But now that they have, now that teachers have been taking classes for more than six months today uh, online, what bridges do you see the teachers crossing and the teachers as a community crossing? I mean, why should, uh, um, I mean, honestly, I can tell you some private schools are still very good, but go down to government schools, go down to uh, very small private schools. I mean, a teacher would feel that he's much better off or she's much better off being on a, or tutoring on a Baiju or a Vedantu or some other place. So what bridges do you see them crossing through this? And do you think for them, uh, online teaching, having YouTube channels would become more lucrative than actually becoming a school teacher. And what disruption do you see happening there in the coming time? Sure, I'll take that. Um, I think two, two to three things are happening. One is, like you rightly said, um, if it's financially more remunerative to work from a tech company today, then the good teachers, the teachers who have the ability and the skills to teach online, communicate well, um, have those skills, will move there. What is also happening is, the teachers who are struggling to teach online are being will probably be asked to leave the profession because teachers have to adopt a lot of times technology and if they don't then it's going to be difficult for them to survive so we're seeing both of these two things happen right the top cream the people who want better financial returns and rightfully so adopt uh, some of these tech platforms and the ones who are struggling to adopt tech will have to reskill them to pretty rapidly because it's going to be a tough way for them. but do you see Schools becoming losers in this because they might lose their best talent to online or no, digital I space. So. I think and, uh, uh, so they might lose some talent, sure. I think uh, we cannot completely disregard that. But schools aren't going anywhere because, uh, like Namita rightly said, I think schools are a place for kids to not just learn academically but every other life skill possible. So uh, they might lose some talent, but I don't think they will suffer. So far, I mean, some of these online platforms have been running even before the pandemic and a lot of teachers, majority of teachers are the first time teachers, right? So these are not people who've been teaching. And if you think about it, a lot of these online tuition happen 4 to 9 p.m., right? So if, they, if the school's teachers were to change the profession, it would not be because of pandemic or, 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 uh, or they are finding these platforms more lucrative. I think this, these platforms are actually uh, finding new talent. Right. So I don't see this as an either or. It's, it's basically increasing the workforce, and maybe maybe you will lose, right? And that's the part of competitive um, any market, right? But uh, that I don't think schools will be losers. So sure. there, there there will be a pressure on schools to recognize talent, which is a good thing overall because teachers have teaching as a profession has not been has uh, is not uh, you know teachers crave for recognition, they crave for career progression, and all of this have been systemically missing from the uh, from from the school structure so some of those things actually need to come in place so if uh, the, if at all there will be a good pressure on the school system to do to do good on those things um so yeah i mean um, uh, the bigger worry is really for the schools in this case as uh, you know and that our children are there practically from nine to three so <laughs> so we we're looking at some kind of uh, disruption happening in that space. So um, another area uh, that one has been seeing, and you know, you rightly said preschool and after school and tutoring being, coaching being uh, one of the very big areas that is going to be impacted. So, you know, live teaching versus pre-recorded content. What are your thoughts on it? Do you think we are moving towards an era of more live teaching online, even when uh, we're back to normal and open up as a society? Or do you feel that uh, pre-recorded content is going to somehow uh, lead the stack. Karan, you want to take that? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think it, it's entirely dependent on use case, right? If you are, um, you know, looking at light learning or um, okay, things which can be even uh, in sort of um, imparted through small groups, <coughs> excuse me, um, 
it does not necessarily, uh, in my opinion, this have to be live learning, right? Um, but if it's concept based or practical adaptation of what you're learning, and, and certainly age group wise, right? I think it's easier for uh, slightly older, it's a young adults or adults to have uh, pre-recorded content and be able to assimilate from that. Because for younger children, uh, having pre-recorded content does not necessarily work, even if it's you know, even if it's live learning. So um, I think it, it squarely depends on what uh, is being taught. Um, I, I think what I have seen a lot of platforms do well is have a combination of both, where you have both um, live as well as pre-recorded. Um, which allows you to also go back and check on concepts that you know one has been um, one has been learning, um, because e even in school, right, even in a physical setting, you are not necessarily taking everything that's being taught. Uh, even on one on one, if it's in a physical setting, sometimes you do have to go back and revise. So, <clears throat> I'm I'm not sure why that behavior would change just because you're on a digital platform. Um, so, I I think the, the the platforms which have which deploy a combination, especially if it's you know, beyond light or surface level. Um, that's probably the right way to look at it. Um, but I, I think it's about having the right tools to help uh, people in a pre in an asynchronous environment. Um, if you if you don't have the right tools, if, it, if that infrastructure is not in place, uh, which takes care of things like, you know, bandwidth, um, how to go back, how to be able to check on concepts um, uh, on a uh, on a asynchronous basis, then that environment also doesn't work. So I think those are things that some of the platforms which take care of uh, while they're building it. Um, any second thoughts on that? You know, I, I think an element of, of this question also exists in, in the previous question, right? Like, so how do you augment teacher income, right? And I think if, if I go back to the time when I was in school and at least most of my nieces and nephews today, you know, most teachers not only taught in school, but they also gave tutoring, right? And then, and there could be an element where, you know, you still have the teacher coming to school, right? Because that is required to keep up with the curriculum and things that are going on. But you also have them doing pre-recorded classes, right? Or doing live classes. So the live classes could cost more and the pre-recorded classes could cost less. And now the teacher can use technology to, ex 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 you know, uh, grow their reach almost exponentially, right? I mean, if you look at even, even the father of valuation, you know, which is Aswad Damodar, and he gives his uh, NYU Stern classes for free, right? You can actually join the live class and do it for free. Why, why couldn't teachers do that? Like, why couldn't schools do that, right? And, and today, you know, they could then go to even a small village and, and, and compete with the government school by offering better content and better reach, right? And, and I think these kind of things, again, these are, this is all crystal gazing, you know, crystal ball gazing at this point, but these are all possible. And it's all possible in the future, as, as, as Karan said, if, if, the, uh, you know, if, if, if the education ministry, if the government starts promoting and allowing these things to happen, I definitely see that this is, a model uh, that that will that will you know evolve, and we'll obviously find multiple different variations of it. Sure. Um, <clears throat> another area that I would want to touch upon is upskilling, reskilling, and the future of work. Um, certainly, you know, uh, everybody knows that the job market is uh, now dwindled, particularly during the pandemic, and reskilling and you know being ready for the new economy the digital economy is very important so do you feel that edtech and you know the job market tech somewhere needs to now get more collaborative and therefore the competition between universities and edtech companies giving upskilling courses is going to become more intense in the coming times i actually think there is also this is exactly this is similar to your question on collaboration versus divide right so there, there is actually a, also a lot more opportunity for collaboration uh, for upskilling companies which have been focusing on uh, people already in the workforce to now go and collaborate with universities and start offering for what i was initially talking about pre starting from pre final year to final year and some of these companies are already doing that, right? As we speak, right? They started this uh, as soon as the pandemic hit and colleges were, were facing with all the challenges. Um, uh, but to your original question on the job, the, the li linking the skilling and the job, job tech, I think it's an important one because uh, I, I think the consumers are going to become smarter. It's not just about the access and the degree anymore. It's about the outcomes. And for, for the outcomes, you have to do skilling and uh, placements both and the more the collaboration can be either the models are built for skilling and placement fully or or there could be some kind of collaboration between the job tech 
and the skilling that that would actually be more beneficial and you you can create more value and capture more value as a result right and build build successful businesses so we we specifically look for outcomes linked skilling programs whether it is upskilling or first time skilling so i do see i do i i do agree with you that there needs to be more linkages sure anybody who would yeah, like no i would agree i think um, yeah just to add i think it's a little bit more nuanced right for instance if you are trying to upskill an existing college student uh, i don't think he is interested in upskilling he is interested in a job most kids in india go to college get a degree and a job right so while the the, the positioning to him is upskilling he is interested in boss can this get me a job right so which means that if you're doing it at a college student level it has to be at a lower price point and i need conversion the second nuance to this is we are obviously seeing schools that come with income share agreements etc while theoretically i think it sounds good i think there is a massive change in behavior that's required because in india if someone says that you have to give me a part of your salary for the longest of time they will balk at it it's the same thing with a loan but the perception is very different right he's like boss i deserve this job i'm not going to give you a share of my income so there is consumer behavior change that's also required um so i i think it's a very massive opportunity but it has to be played very sharply very smartly depending on the segment that you're going after so each segment whether you are minus 1 pre graduation or 1 to 5 5 to 10 the perception the value prop is very different for each sure and i mean finally any thoughts on the national education policy i mean you know how do you think uh, that is going to be a big uh, kick Uh, starter for the digital world. I mean, you know, if I were to look at the, how government is thinking, they they are entirely happy with having digital schools and digital varsities going forward. I mean, uh, which is a good thing because obviously they are looking more from a penetration and access perspective. Uh, so it completely works over there. But I think the middle road that you said, where a good teacher can actually uh, sort of also teach the uh, through pre-recorded sessions uh, to government schools or anybody else. is far more favorable so i mean what 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 is your thoughts on the national education policy and the outcome of it maybe 5 years down the line i i can take that up for uh, the first stab uh, i think there's a lot of very useful um, propositions in national education policy right it is it is Full of great ideas. Um, of course, the implementation of it will be some you know, will be a challenge, and we you know, and they they put out a 15-year roadmap, right? It's not like it has to happen all tomorrow. But I think some of the things that they've called out are going to ask for quality and hence you know collaboration, right? Uh, and what I mean by that, like for example, they are talking about assessment reform completely. Assessments is not going to be root based anyway, right? I know CBSE is already thinking about the board exam reform. So once that starts to happen, even starting from grade five, the teachers have to start teaching differently. It's not only about grade ten, grade twelve anymore. Um, then there is an inclusion of all digital skills, life skills. So this will require overhaul of curriculum, inclusion, including new curriculum, and 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 especially the early, even starting the early childhood. Even though private schools offer already nursery KG, but there is, there is going to be a lot more focus on play based learning, etc. Similarly, in higher education, right now they're talking a lot more about access, uh, which is to increase the gross enrollment ratio. Hopefully, we will not make the mistake that we've made in the past of just increasing the access and not focusing on quality at all. And hopefully, the consumers yeah. will also come out and really say that you know this this needs to be more outcome oriented. So, so they will. They, they, there is uh, there is going to be both because the schools will need to move, but also consumers will start demanding better, especially in higher education. So, I am I am very hopeful that uh, the If policy implemented well, will lead to more collaboration and more opportunities. Sure. So the marriage between quality and uh, access needs to somewhere be created. Yeah. Um, sure. Um, any anybody else who wants to comment on the national education policy and its outcomes? No, I, I think um, you know Navita sort of encapsulated it really well. Um, I think it's hard to find fault with the intent. um uh, you know and the ideas that are uh, prescribed um it will really require a, a overhaul on all fronts right? both on the um instructor side or on on the institute side on how parents and children sort of um view the entire education cycle um i think it's not sure if it will have 
a lot of deep impact in a five-year period um, as, as it comes out with it. I think it's a, certainly a 15, 20, I think so these are generational changes uh, which take you know, a long time. But I think ultimately, if, if things work well, the best outcome one can hope is a, a genuinely skilled population that can um, you know, take advantage of several opportunities that will exist you know, into the 2030s and 40s. Um, that will, you know, I mean, our, our world 20 years from now will be very different. Right? So you want, you, want, you want to have a population that can take care of that and not have a demographic dividend which comes and actually becomes a liability like it seemingly is right now. So I think that's, that's the big consideration to really uh, address. Totally. Um, so there's a question that has come on from our uh, um, uh, uh, event platform, which says that, and it's directed to Namita, you spoke about the need for education for first year and second year students. What exactly are the opportunities you're referring to? Yeah, I think uh, uh, from both uh, teaching technical skills and employability skills, uh, there is a need. Um, so, so uh, I, I think you can graduate as a computer science uh, engineer, but you really do not know how to code. And there's a lot of report and data already out there, right? So even if you teach, so there is, there is uh, so even just the technical skilling from that perspective, the stream in which students are learning, and I don't mean only coding, right? It could be other engineering subjects or other, even accounting commerce, right? So the technical skills need to be sharpened. And the other is really the employability skills, right? Which could be, I mean, quote unquote, soft skills. Uh, so there's an opportunity in both in, in terms of skilling, uh, skilling and getting them prepared for workforce. Sure. Another question is, do you see edtech startups um, uh, getting challenged uh, because of offline? Uh, once the school starts, they, I mean, they might have their enrollment enrollment might go down. I think it depends on where in the edtech space are you operating. I mean, I think uh, referring to trying to like tutoring classes or uh, you know, I mean, to the likes of even. I, yeah. yeah, I think it's only going to go up because once people have seen the value of technology, used it, experienced it, uh, the value of all the tools that come with it, uh, it's very people don't go back. We have seen that with e-commerce. We have seen with multiple other sectors. I think it's actually going to continue to go up. Okay, so uh, well, that, that was an interesting discussion. Any parting thoughts that you have on, uh, you know, edtech and uh, where where you see it going in the coming time? So maybe particularly once we open up December twenty twenty, what does it look like for the edtech sector? Ravi, just say. Talking. Oh no, go on, Namita. No, I'll just say I'm just seeing such influx of high quality talent in the edtech space, the entrepreneurs, right? So that. You know, ultimately, that those are the rock stars, right? And you know, I, I, that makes me even more hopeful about the sector. Surely, yeah. Um, no, I think it's an incredibly exciting times. A uh, lot of opportunities, lots of overfunding. I think in the short term, uh, you will expect a lot of funding to go to what I call as a big three of edtech in India, um, and they will attract tons of capital. Uh, over a period of time, the cycle will wane off, the, the euphoria will wear off. Uh, there will be some pain in some sectors where overfunding has happened. But I think overall, the opportunities are massive, uh, massive segment, massive pools of capital, uh, massive profit pools. 80% gross margins for a few sectors which can give you that. So I think the, uh, the promise is great. Uh, absolutely. Do you see some m and activity increasing once uh, things open up in the edtech space? think so. It's already happening and I think it will continue to happen. Uh, definitely. Anirudh? As a country, we spend almost 3% of our GDP. Public expenditure on G is, is almost 3% of GDP. Plus, you know, I think every middle class, every in fact, not just middle class, but every class of family in India, right, earmarks a large chunk of their savings towards the child's education. So as far as money is concerned, this is, you know, this is the largest pool of money we can even think about that is getting spent on an annual basis, right? But again, I, I, I too, you know, and I think everyone's sort of re reference is, is that, let's not get overexcited, right? There is still a lot of work to be done. The NEP policy is, you know, lays out things to 2040, which means there is five uh, national elections minimum that need to happen by the time this policy completely rolls itself out. So, you know, we, we 
entrepreneurs should be cognizant. You know, they should they should be nimble and and just not get caught up with the massive numbers. You need to really have uh, you know it's it, it's much more important to figure out which part of the river you you cater to versus the entire size of the river itself. Uh, Karan, do you see a quota getting wiped off because of the pandemic and head tech? No, no. I, I look. I think longer term, um, because of the size of the opportunity, because of the ongoing spend. I think the spends on education and learning will just go up because as you know, the, the each generation will subsequently spend more on or will want to spend more on their children as well as a little bit on themselves, which wasn't the case 30, 40 years back, right? Um, I think the only takeaway really is, you know, there is obviously a lot of interest from investors and founders. Um, there are several areas within the net tech where you can build good sustainable businesses. Uh, you don't need to necessarily go for, uh, you know, outrageous growth rates. Uh, the growth rates will come as the market evolves. And we've seen this in every market or every segment of the market that got digitized. Um, hopefully, we'll all learn our lesson from that. But I think ultimately, yes, it's 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 certainly on the largest set of up, large area where the sets of outcomes can be multiple, will probably be multiple. We've seen three, four companies already. Um, and, uh, you know, that inflection point is probably... Uh, already happened, and you know there, there will be another inflection point probably five, six years from now. Sure, thank you very much to the entire panel. I think some great, great inputs out there, and um, you know I'm I'm absolutely excited and uh, looking forward to what is going to happen in the education space in the coming times. I've never seen so much vibrancy in this sector ever. I mean, we've been doing events on education for the longest time, but I think the times that I've seen in 2020 for this sector is unparalleled. So thank you for coming and sharing what, and giving us sort of a future crystal gaze as to what uh, the sector looks like in the coming times. And I'm glad to hear that, you know, uh, the idea is not to disrupt education, edu educational institutions, but to work closely and see that there is going to be a bigger, uh, the empowerment of the child who is looking to take quality education.